child battling for her life after being hit by a speeding car. Charter residents homeless after fire raised several buildings at Plaisance. Minister Ali denies there was a sex scandal at the New Opportunity Core. 500,000 barrels of oil to be extracted from Guyana daily as ExxonMobil makes its seventh oil discovery. Those were the top headlines for the week ending March 2. I'm Sandy Ramutar. Good afternoon. Starting things off on MTV News Update's weekend review, we tell you that a child is now left battling for her life after an alleged speeding car cannoned into her in perfect harmony. The driver involved in an accident that fled the scene, leaving the girl helpless and injured on the road. Nikhil Jondu with this story. 12-year-old Maharani Budaram of Lot 2250, Parfit Harmony, West Bank, Demerara, is battling for her life. The child was allegedly knocked down by a speeding driver on Sunday afternoon. The accident took place on a lonely stretch of the road in Parfit Harmony. A relative of the child said Budaram was returning from a nearby shop when the accident occurred. So we just picked her up and we took her to Best Hospital. Uh, she was actually panting for breath. She wasn't speaking anything, but as you could see that she was trying to breathe, and as she was breathing, you could see the, the ears, everything, the blood was bubbling in her ears and stuff. So we took her there and they, they tried to stabilize her there and actually wrap her legs around and stuff, because her like they said her, uh, her left side from hip down is broken. So they tried to wrap her up and stabilize her, then they, uh, they took her with the ambulance to Georgetown. The relative said the driver of the vehicle is well known in the area. However, the man failed to render assistance. The man said when he was trying to get a vehicle to transport the child to the West Demerara Regional Hospital, the driver fled the scene. So I saw the driver was there. And I mean, he know me, right? I know him personally because I travel with him a lot of times. So instead of him coming to me and offer to assist me, you know, he just stood there. So I got someone to help me, my brother-in-law actually, and by the time I picked her up when I looked, he was already gone. He left the bus, he left the key in the bus and everything, and he just fled the scene. The child is currently on life support at the Georgetown Public Hospital. Police said the driver eventually turned himself in to the Lagrange Police Station on Sunday night. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The Board of Directors of the Ghana National Broadcasting Agency is currently discussing the granting of television broadcasting license. To date, broadcast licenses for television have not been granted for 2018. Here is more from Yanis Abrams. Chairman of the Ghana National Broadcasting Authority, Leslie Sobers, announced by the end of March, discussions will be completed among board members and television licenses will be granted to broadcasters. Sobers, during an exclusive interview, explained to News Update that there is a process which the agency has to follow before issuing licenses. There are a number of things that have to be done, and before the board takes into account uh, what uh, licensees are going to be approved. And the process involves making the checks at the, the GNBA, their licensing department, and then those who have uh, those who are fully compliant will be presented first to the committee the licensing fees and legal committee and then that committee would make further recommendations to the board for persons to be licensed and that process is ongoing the chairman noted that broadcasters have indicated the zones where they prefer to operate in Meanwhile, the GNBS plans to open the radio spectrum to accommodate more radio broadcasters. Sobers noted that talks will begin with the National Frequency Management Unit soon. The head of NFMU is an ex-officio member of the board of GNBA. So to speak with NFMU is almost instant. The, the head of the NFMU is privy to the thinking of the board so we would just have to set a time when we could sit down together and examine and using the, the electromagnetic spectrum map to see how things could be worked out but uh, this is not anything that could be done overnight according to the chairman 
more persons have shown interest in acquiring radio licenses. In January, six broadcasters were given their radio licenses. Those who received licenses are CNS Incorporated, Brutal Group Incorporated, Pinnacle Communications Incorporated, National Media and Broadcasting Company Limited, Two Brothers Corporation, and Black and Sons Incorporated. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. While two estates are expected to be reopened, the retrenched sugar workers are bound to resist as they will not agree to be reinstated unless the Ghana Agricultural and General Workers Union is involved. Here is more. The two estates will be reopened in an effort to attract potential investors, Skeldon and more estates. President of the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union, Gao, Komal Chan says unless the union is placed at the forefront, there will be resistance from workers to be reinstated, Chan affirmed. The statement comes on the heels of temporary contractual agreements which will be offered to some workers. What is worrying that they want to employ them on a contractual basis, that is either to have them engage under a contractor who provide laborers to do the different work or to have them engage in a one-on-one -on -one contract. Um, that will mean that they will try to suppress their conditions of work and pay levels. And that is a dangerous um, way to go. Chan believes the union should be given the chance to examine the circumstances for workers to be rehired. At this point, the union is uncertain whether they will be able to represent workers after privatization of the two estates. To, 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 to be represented by a union of their choice and not to have um, to, to engage as a contract worker. It's where many of their benefits will be ignored and they will pay them one straight pay, like they obtain incentive as they produce certain level of production. They have benefits of obtaining cutlass and files tools. Those are benefits that came out of the agreement, transportation to the work site, whatever they are all. If I'm not know, I don't know if the company will what they will retain, but certainly the workers, um, because of their large number and because of so many problems that they will encounter every day and disputes, they would require a representative body. $15 billion will be needed to ensure the two factories are fully operational before the rehiring process commences. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. As Black History Month comes to an end, the Rastafarian community endured the scorching heat of the sun and marched 30 miles calling for the decriminalization of cannabis. The group was at the time referring to the criminalization of small quantities of the herb, which oftentimes placed persons behind bars. Marijuana is a psychoactive drug. It is the dry leaves of the cannabis plant. We since the CARICOM country, Jamaica, decriminalized marijuana for the Rastafari community more so and for medical reasons. And I have seen the said law that gave our nice sister country, Jamaica, the rights of the citizens to practice the Rastafari culture. I and I seek the same rights in Guyana and demanding the rights this day from the government of Guyana for the prosecution of the Rastafari family. This march is to for the criminalization of the cannabis marijuana M. And it's been a great day. Give thanks to Kuala Mavi, Ailey Selassie. A nice day, beautiful day. And I give thanks that we all reach here safe at the square of the revolution. To acknowledge and recognize the Rastafari community as a religion and change the laws of the land that bar I and I from practicing we call and putting we in prison for marijuana. We ask the government to review the narcotic law and decriminalize marijuana by giving the Rastafari community the rights to the sacramental use of the holy herb. The crowd believes the herb should be used for medical and recreational purposes. The walk was facilitated by the Rastafarian community from Boxton. The group assembled at Boxton and marched 13 miles to the square of the revolution.
The march is expected to stop the stigma associated with the herb and educate persons about the benefits. In 2015, Jamaica has been announced to be the first country in the Caribbean to decriminalize small quantities of the herb. While the call has over time been brought in the limelight, the government has not yet placed the herb on the cards for discussions. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. New Opportunity Corps has been rocked by another sex scandal. There are claims that two staff of the correctional institution are having sexual relations with the children. However, Minister of Social Protection Amna Ali claims the allegations are untrue. Nikhil John Lu tells us more. Minister of Social Protection Amna Ali says she is not aware of the sex scandal plaguing the New Opportunity Corps. During an interview on Monday afternoon, the minister said the matter has not been brought to her attention. On Sunday, it was reported in sections of the media that several complaints were made to the administration of the NOC. However, no efforts have been made to address those complaints. I don't know anything about any sex allegations because I have found out and there is no such thing going on there. The report added that two staff is involved in sexual relations with female inmates at the NOC. It added that several complaints were made to the administrator detailing what has been taking place under his watch. However, when those complaints were made, persons are allegedly subjected to undue pressure and other forms of victimization. The minister said the allegations are untrue. It is not true. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Tom Clark Royston King is now convinced that Councillor Sherrod Duncan is out to get him. This follows a no confidence motion that was filed by Duncan against King. Here's more from Yannis Abrams. Tom Clark Royston King believes that Councillor Sherrod Duncan has a personal vendetta against him. Duncan filed a no confidence motion against the town clerk at the council's statutory meeting, stating that King is unfit to run the administration of the city. That motion was seconded by Deputy Mayor Lionel Jaikaran. Duncan believes King signed a parking meter contract with Smart City Solutions and also leased parts of the Bailey Park playground without council's approval. However, the town clerk believes he is doing his job to the best of his abilities. All of the things mentioned in the motion uh, to which the Honorable Councillor has filed against, those are the very things that have helped improve the city and that we have seen physical, uh, we've seen a change in the physical and aesthetic uh, condition of the city since we took office. And that the, the fact that this, this question about the town clerk should go and the mayor should go has been the Honorable Councillor's mantra from the time he came into the council. From the time the councillor came into this council, councillor uh, Sherrod Avery Duncan, he has been uh, singing this mantra that the town clerk should go, that the mayor should go. King gave his full confidence that other councillors will support him through his tenure as the chief administrator. King stated clearly he is not to be blamed for Duncan's demotion from deputy mayor and for not acquiring the mayoral position. If you look at some of the things he's been saying, he has not only been attacking the office of the town clerk, but he has been attacking my persona. And, um, you know, it is there for all to see. Like I said, I, I could not be held responsible for Councilor Duncan not being mayor of the city, not being elected as mayor, not being re-elected. If councillors, uh, if councillors have no confidence in, in the councillor to make re-elect him as deputy mayor, I couldn't be faulted for that. And I couldn't be faulted for not giving the councillor what he's not entitled to, which things he believes that he's entitled to. So, you know, you get to see that there is a personal agenda against the office of the town clerk and, and I dare say against the office of the mayor. Uh, coming from this, this honorable councillor. Councillor Sherrod Duncan has been bashing the town clerk for some time now, expressing his disapproval for the decisions King has been making. Duncan is a former deputy mayor. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. The government is again showing a more humanistic and empathetic side by donating items to the many persons that were rendered homeless following the major fire at Plaisance. 
Kitchen utensils and cash were just some of the items given to the fire victims. Here's more from Nikhil Jondu. The fire victims of Pleasant's East Coast Demerara were beneficiaries of kitchen utensils, toiletries and money from the government. The simple yet significant handing over ceremony was conducted at the Pleasance Secondary School on Monday afternoon. Most of the affected persons were there to collect their supplies. Minister of Social Protection Amna Ali said she is saddened by the devastating loss of their personal belongings, including the loss of a life. However, she encouraged the affected persons to continue to live their lives as they start a new footing. It may not be too much, but I know that there are going to be people who will chip in and help you. We have tried our best to make some things available to you. And I'm sure that it is not going to be enough. But we have tried our best to see at least to help to bring some relief to you. Some of the beneficiaries thank the government and those involved in making the timely donation towards them. One mother said she is living in her car while her three children are at relatives and at a friend. It will help in some aspect of getting my life back together because I don't want to be at the shelter all the time. But I'm a seamstress and I don't know, I didn't check to see how much is the check, but I might use it to purchase a sewing machine because I lost more than one in the fire. First of all, I want to thank God for life. And with regard to the contribution, I know it's going to go a long way because I have um, three kids going to school. Uh, and um, It's not easy when you have kids going to school. This contribution will go towards ensuring that the transition from what they're accustomed to to what they will be getting into is seamless. The fire engulfed the apartment complex located just off the Pleasance line top on Friday, February 23. Reports are that when the fire started, persons formed a bucket brigade until the firefighters arrived to quell the blaze. However, both efforts proved futile. The charred remains of a pensioner were found after the fire was put out. The affected families and individuals are being housed at the Pleasance Community Center while others have been taken in by relatives and friends. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. In a bizarre story, a taxi driver in Barbies is alleging that a female passenger robbed him of its cash and set his motor car on fire. Find out more in this report. Divisional Commander Lyndon Alves during an interview says the investigation is still ongoing. Commander Alves said the taxi driver has not been able to recognize the alleged bandit. Reports are that the alleged bandit was a female passenger who boarded the taxi to be dropped off at the popular number 63 beach. Commander Alves noted that they are pursuing all leads to arrest the perpetrator. According to reports, the taxi driver claims that he picked up the female passenger after leaving a friend's house at number 59 village. The taxi driver further claims that the passenger told him that she was going to buy fish at the beach and only had $2,000. The man said while he was heading towards the main entrance to the beach, the woman told him to take a different street. The taxi driver said the woman pointed a gun to his neck and demanded that he hand over his cash. However, the only cash he had was the $2,000 that was paid to him by the very woman. The man further told investigators that the bandit demanded that he hand over his cellular phone, the $2,000 and his motor car. The taxi driver eventually escaped and ran to the number 62 village police outpost where he made the report. He returned to the scene with ranks where they discovered the motor car on fire. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. 
A new department will be established to oversee the petroleum sector, taking away the responsibility from Natural Resources Minister Rafael Trotman. Nikhil Jonu with the details. Minister of Natural Resources Rafael Trotman says a new department will be established to oversee the petroleum sector. Minister Trotman made the disclosure on Tuesday night following the weekly cabinet meeting. He said the new department is expected to come on stream in approximately six months. It will be housed at the Ministry of the Presidency. Minister Trotman said in the lead up to its establishment, cabinet has mandated that he will head a task force which would comprise the ministers of finance, state, public infrastructure and business, the ministers of public security, public telecommunications, ministers of education and social protection are also expected to be included. I did propose to His Excellency the President that we begin considering the establishment of a department of energy which department will be the one that is focused only on the development of the petroleum sector. And so today we held and had a very lively discussion on the proposal which I presented. And it has been determined and decided that we will have the Department of Energy uh, established. And this will be coming within the next few months. It will be housed at the Ministry of the Presidency. Minister Trotman further added that the proposal was submitted to Cabinet. Key among those was the proposal that all policy matters, including but not limited to the negotiating and entering into contracts and issuing of licenses for exploration and production, be transferred or reassigned to the Ministry of the Presidency and placed within a Department of Energy and Development. Eventually, uh, the expectation is that the Ministry of Natural Resources will hand over responsibility of the function of petroleum to this new department, and we will see a more direct uh, and focused uh, mandate uh, from this Department of Energy, and we will, of course, as a cabinet, be supporting the department. Meantime, oil consultant Charles Ramson Jr. during an interview believes that Minister Trotman's decision to relinquish the responsibilities of the oil and gas sector to the Ministry of the Presidency does not add up. He added that the contract, which was signed between ExxonMobil and the government of Guyana in 2016, is still binding. Nothing can go back to the negotiating table because of the stability agreement under the contract. So the fact that Minister Trotman has uh, relinquished responsibility um, for oil and gas at this stage, in, in Guyana we say, both done gone or falls. We've already entered into a bad agreement and there's no possibility of us um, renegotiating. Now we're going to be tra trapped for decades to come by this deal, this, the terms of that agreement. The oil consultant further believes that the head of that department will be someone closely affiliated with the government. I think this, what the government has shown so far is that they are fairly territorial and tribal about their appointments, which means that if you're not from their clan and, or if you're not supporting their clan, they're not really intending on appointing you. And I'd ask you the question, I mean, have we seen one appointment of anyone that is within their full ambit um, of anyone who's been critical of them? And the answer is no. If, if you are a PPP supporter or a PPP member, be very sure that you are not going to be asked to be appointed anywhere. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Still on the petroleum sector, Nikhil John will now tell you that ExxonMobil has made its seventh oil discovery offshore Guyana. The latest oil find will push the company's production to more than 500,000 barrels of oil per day. U.S. oil giant ExxonMobil has made another significant oil discovery. ExxonMobil in a statement says, drilling commenced on January 29, 2018 at the Pakora One Exploration Well. During the drilling, the company encountered approximately 65 feet of a high-quality oil-bearing sandstone reservoir. The company said the well was safely drilled to 18,363 feet deep in 6,781 feet of water. ExxonMobil said this latest discovery 
further increases their confidence in developing this key area of the Stabrook block. It stated that Pokora will be developed in conjunction with the giant Payara field. It will also bring Guyana's production to more than 500,000 barrels of oil per day. ExxonMobil says the Pokora One well is located approximately four miles west of the Payara One well and follows previous discoveries on the Stabrook block at Lisa Payara, Lisa Deep Snook Turbot, and Ranger Wells. Following completion of the Pakura One Well, the Stena Karen drill ship will move to the Lisa Field to drill the Lisa Four Well and complete a well test that will be used to assess the concepts for the Payara development. ExxonMobil said following the Lisa Five, the Stena Karen drill ship will conduct additional exploration and appraisal drilling on the block. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The town clerk Royston King believes that a forensic audit will reveal the financial status of the council. As such, he encourages the Auditor General to audit the municipality. Here's more from Yannis Abrams. The town clerk Royston King welcomed the forensic audit at City Hall. His position comes after the Auditor General, Diodat Sharma, announced that the AG's office will conduct a forensic audit at the city's municipality. The town clerk believes that the audit will give the administration an idea of the financial status of the council. King said the Treasury Department is awaiting the auditors so there can be transparency at City Hall. Um, he's always been helpful to the, to the, to the council. Um, we believe an audit is good. An audit gives us a chance to see the weaknesses and strengths in our financial systems, where we need to remedy, where we need to improve. It will show what we've done, how we've been improving the system, the efficiency in the system. We welcome the audit. We, we really welcome the audit. King revealed that in reports, it was stated that the council was not cooperating in providing information to the Ministry of Communities. He further clarified the issue was the organization and presentation of the information. It was justified that the documents needed to be clarified before presentation. It needs to be properly organized and it needs to be presented in a way for people to understand and to make sense of it, particularly the auditors. And this is what the Treasury Department, is, 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 as we speak, is working on. Apart from King, Mayor Patricia Chase Green also welcomed such an audit. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. Just days before retiring from the Ghana Police Force, Commissioner of Police Silal Prasad has found himself in a controversial atmosphere with his political directorate. Nika Jondu reports. During an interview with outgoing top cop Silal Prasad, he confirmed that the gun dealership license, which he self-approved, was not granted by Minister of Public Security Kemraj Ramzitan. Prasad told media operatives that he made the application in January, months before retiring. Prasad believes that what goes for one may not go for the other as in his case. If you look historically, you would see that over the last 25 years, all the commissioners, maybe with the exception of one, granted themselves firearm license. There's not anything new. And you know, we live in a society today where one set of circumstances is good for one person but not good for the other. He noted that the dealership license would have been used when he retires from the job and his business will become operational in May. However, that venture would not be continued, stressed the commissioner. Prasad said he was not bothered by the revocation of the gun dealership license by the minister. In the 1980s, there was a commissioner who granted himself a um, dealership license, so there is precedent. However, I was discouraged to go along that um, line of business, and so I wouldn't pursue that. So you don't see anything wrong with it? No, there's precedent for it. It happened with all the commissioners. Something is wrong with this commissioner that they say, tell the public that what it is wrong. wrong. I don't know, those who write the task chronicle, and ask the officer who told them that. But why are you giving instructions to revoke, to revoke it? Um, the, the dealership, yes. Meantime, when media operatives approached Minister Ramjitan for a comment on the issue, he was reluctant to answer questions pertinent to the topic. 
you seem not to have a time and place, apparently. Well, you don't know? You don't All right, well, please, absolutely. You don't want me to tell you. Why are you dodging this? I am not dodging no issue. Did I, did, I, did I tell you? Did I not talk to you? And you got it in the Marara And you also Yes, well, friends, yes. I could, I, 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 yes, there are times when I could use expletives. Okay, sir, sir, talk Okay, well, us. please, I'm not going to, I'm not having a... T t t the, the, the applications yeah, please, come sir, to your sir, desk. Sir, sir. Uh, you could all yes. What? What? The Guyana Press Association, in a statement, condemns in the strongest possible terms the verbal attacks on its executive member, Dennis Chirol, and fellow journalists by Minister Ramchatan. Two members of the GPA made complaints about the verbal abuse, which took place twice on Wednesday. The online news journalist was verbally abused when he asked for a comment on the revocation of the dealership license for top cop Silar Posad. The association calls on Minister Ramchatan to apologize to journalists and also calls on President David Granger to remind his cabinet that journalists play a major role in this growing democracy. The statement added that journalists should be allowed to do their jobs without fear or hindrance. The GPA said it remains committed to ensuring that its members remain respectful in their trade. It also noted that this trend is becoming increasingly difficult when dealing with some ministers of government and public officials. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. When the first public hearing of the Lindo Creek Commission began on March 1, a detective testified to have seen bones and skulls when he arrived at the scene. Yannis Abrams was there and filed this report. The first public hearing of the Lindo Creek Commission of Inquiry commenced today, with witnesses being questioned by attorney at law Patrice Henry and Commissioner Retired Justice Donald Trotman. Retired Justice Trotman stated that before the first public hearing, Several interviews were conducted privately. The first witness called to the stand was retired detective, Sergeant Clintsford Burnett. During questioning, Burnett revealed that whilst on duty, he was instructed to go at a crime scene at Lindo Creek where it was reported that several minors were killed and burnt. The retired police officer explained when he arrived at the location, bones and skulls were seen in a heap. I made checks around the area and I found one 7.62, one 7.62 by 35 caliber spin ammunition. Ammunition? Yeah. And four 7.62 by 39 spin shells. I found a hammer, the sledgehammer, about six to seven pounds. And checking for the checks, I found a Scotia Bank, a Scotia Bank account, bank book. I also found one black battery operated with swatch. I found one board certificate with the name uh, Barry Lloyd Patrick Harry. Barry Lloyd Patrick Harry. All oh, these are you speaking about you found on the heap? Not on the heap. Oh. Those are things just left in the area. So in the, area. the wife of the late Bonnie Harry also testified. Meanwhile, whilst at the inquiry was in session, friends and family of the victims gathered in front of the Ministry of the Presidency, showing their support of the COI. Just representing this here because there's like the things that go down with these boys here. It's just that young no proper justice out here. You never really like know the truth out here. You know, but to me own knowledge, the truth is that it's the easy cause of this thing. I'm trying to put the blame on someone else, you know what I mean? Which in, you could see is not the individual with the blame and do this thing. Uh, my name is Collis Marshall, representing the Enerokium family concerning the Lindo Creek Massacre. So just showing my support, me, friends who used to work in the interior together, just cheering me, concern. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams.
That's a wrap for MTV News Updates Weekend Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us on Monday, March 5 at 7 hours 30 for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Sandy Ramutar, thanking you for watching.